Welcome to the Nostalgia Test Podcast, the show where two longtime friends put their mainstream pop culture past to the ultimate test, the Nostalgia Test. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of the Nostalgia Test Podcast. I'm Dan Dissinger here in LA, and I'm here with my longtime friend and co-host Manny Coelho there in New York. Manny, how are you doing tonight? Oh man, I'm I'm pumped tonight, Dan. <laughs> yeah, tonight, special night. I am pumped. What's up, everybody? Yeah. If this is the first time at the Nostalgia Test Podcast. This is where two longtime friends put our pop culture past to the test. But tonight <laughs> is a special, special episode. Yeah, awesome episode. Like we're super psyched today. We have an amazing guest with us. Uh, one of the directors of the. Nickelodeon documentary, The Orange Years, Scott Barber. Scott, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We are super excited. Oh, man, the pleasure is all mine. That That's cool that, Dan, that you're in uh, Los Angeles. Manny, you're in New York. I'm in Texas. So we got like all the time zones represented. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> East that's, that's coast, it. west coast, and third coast. That, there you go. That's our pot. I love that. Like this coast, that coast, and here over here. And yeah. That, we can do that type of thing. I'm so glad that we were able to do this because, yeah, in normal times, I mean, it would be really tough to kind of even get this yeah. together. So, yeah, why don't you uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself and um, what, you, what you're up to and a little bit about the, uh, the orange years? Yeah, well, my name is Scott Barber, and I'm one of the directors of a recently released documentary called The Orange Years, The Nickelodeon Story, and the name kind of spells it out. It's a documentary about the origin and uh, kind of what I consider the golden years of Nickelodeon, the 80s and 90s. Uh, It's a real nostalgic, fun look at some really cool times uh, with some people that were really breaking ground and doing crazy revolutionary things. Uh, Adam Sweeney was my co-director on this. And we kind of like to say uh, that our tagline, if you will, is you fell in love with the shows. Now it's time to find out why. So, um, you know, there's all these shows. We kind of noticed that everybody was super nostalgic for 80s and 90s Nickelodeon. When you talk to somebody about that and you bring it up, people's eyes just light up and they're like, oh, remember, hey, dude, Remember Are You Afraid of the Dark? Remember Ren and Stimpy? Remember Double Dare? There was just this real strong reaction from people of a certain age. And we kind of dive into why is that? You know, was it just an accident or was there something more there? And obviously, (laughs) I feel that there was something more there. Uh, There were some people doing some amazing work to understand kids programming in a real unique way. So, yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell who I am and why I'm here. Um, Scott Barber of the Orange Years. Uh, well, Scott, I just got to say, yeah, all the lists that you just came up with. So at, on, in our podcast, when Dan and I talk about what's the next what's the next test we're going to do, you basically this documentary is basically <laughs> gave us all this content. I'm like, oh, we got to put that to the test. There's things that I even like forgot about. And then as yeah. soon as it came on on the documentary, I was like singing and humming the theme song to Doug. Like I hadn't thought about Doug in years. And then I was like. Oh my God. Like I love that show. And like, I was thinking the same thing. Like, why is it because like the eighties were that good and the nineties were that good? Or was there something else? Like what, what was it about right. the shows? Why were they so good that is it are good shows like that now? Are, mm. are there shows out like that now that are doing to the same things that they did to the kids now, like that they did to us as kids? I don't know, but I was happy you came up. I got to say, I watched this documentary twice already. Oh, <laughs> awesome. I'm probably going to watch it like three or four more times yeah. because it was just like, I was smiling ear to ear the whole mm. time. And then yeah. to kind of hear the, even like how you got the interviews that you got is what I really want to know because <laughs> like it was some, I was like, Whoa, a Clarissa. I know. Whoa. You know, like, I was like, Oh my God, that's awesome. Like that you were able to reach out to all these guys and you know, yeah, they were really willing to tell the story because it was such a great time. It seemed like to to work and be mm-hmm. part of this whole thing growing up. Yeah, it is crazy the amount of people that we got, you know, because I've been working on this documentary for so long. You know, we started in 2017. Wow. But sometimes I have to take a step back and go, man, it's crazy how many people from all of our favorite shows we got. You know, we, we actually had to cut it off. We could have kept going. 
you know, I mean, realistically, we could have filmed this thing forever and still gotten more and more people. But that was certainly a chore. You know, mm -hmm. this this documentary is it, it is a total labor of love, a small indie film, uh, a couple of guys with an idea that then got to work with a bunch of other people. You know, other producers came on, other camera people, editors that, that just liked what we were doing and, and joined the party. But that's all it was. It's not there's no big studio behind it. So uh, when Adam and I decided to, uh, you know, do this documentary and uh, at first I don't think we quite understood how challenging that was really going to be to get that many people. You mm -hmm. know, we always joke if we had done a documentary about one movie or one show, you get that cast and crew, five to ten people and you're good. But we're talking, you know, 20 shows over the span of 20 years. So it was a huge undertaking. Yeah. I, yeah. Go ahead, Manny. I was go ahead, Dan. I, uh, I, I spoke was, too much. Right? No, that's no. Yeah, but <laughs> I was gonna say that, like, when you when the documentary started for me, and then you had the president, uh, you know, the former president, the former CEO, or the leader, yeah. really, uh, uh, for Nickelodeon. She was the idea that she had behind Nickelodeon, and the you know, from a teaching background, and everything, and to make programming that didn't speak down to kids mm -hmm. i never looked at it that way but then when i when you guys like put together the clips of all these shows and how they were created and the types of narratives and things that they were developed that developed i was i was blown away and 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 just it made sense like it oh, made yeah. so much sense that it was like yeah, these shows didn't talk down to, ch to kids. They they spoke like to them directly in like their language. And I, I was really, I was really like uh, taken aback from that part. So it was really amazing that you were able to get her to kind of like really open up about that whole kind of development uh, of the Nickelodeon. Yeah, Geraldine Laybourne was mm. awesome. And we were so grateful that we got to interview her for the doc. And thank you for saying that. Uh, I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me because that was really our goal was to explain why was it that these shows connected with you? You know, what was it that was different? Uh, and it's something that, yeah, as a kid, you didn't think of because you're a kid, you know, you're just like, oh, I love this show. I love it. And in a way, it's kind of like your parents, you know, you don't really realize how much cool stuff your parents did for you until you become an adult yourself. You know, you're just like, oh, yeah. oh my parents, blah, blah, blah. And then you're like every single meal that they cooked for me, everything that they did, all the late hours working <laughs> was all for me, you know? Yeah. It's like, wow, I kind of treated them like crap, kind of took them for granted. <laughs> you know, and, in a way, it's kind of like Nickelodeon, you know, we just, we watched it and we thought it was awesome. And now it's like, we're taking a more journalistic look at why mm. we all, we all, all of us that are of that age had that same reaction to these shows. Because let's be honest, there are certain things that we like just because it was on when we were little kids, right? you know? Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to offend anyone uh, listening, but like Poison is a band that I get happy whenever I hear them. And I know completely full well, it's only because it's 80s music and that's, it's not good. It's just, <laughs> that's, that's, it, it reminds me of being a little kid and hearing Poison yeah. on the radio, you know? Um, and there's certainly things that we like just because it's from the 80s and that's when we were yeah. kids and it reminds us of being a little kid. Uh, and I just don't feel like Nickelodeon was that i think mm. that there's something more to it so poison wouldn't pass the nostalgic <laughs> test if you put that to the test i guess like you would say it stays nostalgic it doesn't move yeah past that. i would say so but that's yeah. just me funny that you say like anytime we were thinking about shows the fact that nickelodeon came up so many times like the 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 roster is just insane like, yeah. yeah, Disney's Disney has its own thing. And like there was a part in right in the beginning of the documentary when the logo came up and I was like, I was just thinking in my head before it even came up in the documentary. I'm like, it's like MTV for me, for kids. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that the guy who did the MTV logo helped with yeah. the Nickelodeon logo. Yeah, I was like, oh, my God, that's why I connected that. You know, this was like the, you know, where you went to like get messy and. And watch yeah. crazy shows where like Disney's like, it's a formula, you know, it's good. And there's always a tearjerker. I don't hate on to Toy Stories. I could watch Toy Story for days. That's also yeah. Pixar. But like there's, you know, Disney is Disney. But Nickelodeon was like just so much fun. Like, yeah, I just remember anytime Dan will bring up a, a, a show, I'm like, oh, that was fun. Like, I don't yeah. I almost don't want to put it to the test sometimes because I'm like, I don't want my childhood to be ruined. Right. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I was 
so happy that mm-hmm. that part came up with the logo and stuff. I really wanted to know was I saw your crowdfunding commercial, if you will, video, which yeah. is awesome because I love that you did like uh, homage to every single show that you liked. <laughs> like you had the camp, um, camp nostalgia instead yeah, of camp. Yeah, I, yeah. I was like, oh man, that's, <laughs> you, know, like Pete, you had the Pete and Pete set up you know like on the thing you did so good about like setting up the way um each show was and um i wanted to know like the crowdfunding that you got did you get a good feedback from that yeah we did um and that's it's so funny i i still love that uh that goofy crowdfund video you know because we were we were like how do we convey that what we're trying to do and pull on those nostalgia heartstrings and let people understand what we're trying to do without we didn't want to use clips from the shows because at that point we didn't know if we were allowed to yeah so we're like what if we just recreated it with us yeah and uh and and it was i I shot that but i was also in it so it's like i would set the camera up and then go back and then we would edit it and and all that stuff it was just it was crazy you know we did get a good a good feedback obviously the crowdfund was successful Mm -hmm. and that was one thing adam and i decided was the crowdfund is a great test if the crowdfund isn't successful, that means the movie shouldn't be made because nobody wants it. <laughs> Nobody's into it. It's just us, yeah. you know? So, um, <laughs> so that, that was a great thing that let us know that there was, that was the first time we got an inkling that it, it would be successful. And there were other people out there that would think that this was cool. The one thing that I would urge anybody thinking of doing a crowdfund for a film that we did wrong. Uh, and what I think would make your crowdfund even bigger is, shoot some of your movie first (laughs) and then do a crowdfund (laughs) because you know when we were showing that crowd we quit showing it to people because they're like wait what are is it a movie about you guys are y'all in it we're like no it's a documentary Mm -hmm. we we were showing people this video that didn't look anything like the documentary the crowdfund video is just me and adam acting goofy Mm -hmm. Um, so i wish we had shot like maybe four or five interviews and edited it together because ultimately that's what we did do we took that crowdfund movie uh, that crowdfund that was successful, that money. And we went to Los Angeles and we went to New York mm. and we just got a crap ton of interviews, both. We stayed like five days in New York, five days in LA. And we were just filming like four or five interviews every day. Wow. So um, Yeah. I mean, we had like 20 interviews after our trip, after both of our trips. Mm. Um, and then we cut a little fake trailer together before the movie was even out. Mm-hmm. We just cut a little fake trailer together. And after that, everything was so much easier because we, when we would, we would show it to people, people knew what we meant. Yeah. They knew what we were talking about because we could show them and they could see that the film was going to look good. You know, we could light a shot, we could get good audio and we could edit it and we knew how to do all that stuff. Uh, so we debuted our little fake trailer at um, New York city comic-con in 2017. And that's when it really blew up. That went kind of like, I don't know if you'd call it viral, but you know, we went from having like four or 500 people on our, Facebook and Instagram to like 4,000 wow. It blew up and people were talking about it and it was getting written up. So that's what I wish we had done that from the very beginning. <laughs> what, um, what I was going to say, did you, when you first started, like the, obviously the, some of the interviews aren't linear, but like, did you find out things that you were like, Oh my God, we have to put this in it. And like, it just kept building and building and building because of that. Like speaking to, you know, an executive or an old, illustrator and you're like what oh like they did mighty mouse like they yeah did, they, and you dubbed it and you garfield was dubbed like my mind was blown and that was yeah. not a american show yeah but- and it kind of worked out well for us that some of the interviews for example geraldine Laybourne was the last interview i mean she's the main interview she's yeah. like, her story <laughs> and she was the last interview that we ever filmed wow and that, that actually worked out well for us because we could have cut the movie it wouldn't have been nearly as good but we were actually already cutting the movie. We thought we weren't going to get her. Mm-hmm. So all of her stuff, there was no stress. We already had all the sound bites we wanted. We were able just to ask her more philosophical questions. Mm-hmm. Um, we had all the timeline stuff. First Nickelodeon did this. Then we did this. Then, you know, then it, all that stuff that's more just like narration was already done from the other people. So we were able to ask her why instead of when or how. It was like, why did you do that? And her questions were able to be a lot more from the heart instead of from the brain, because we already had the brain type stuff. Mm, And we also, by that point, we we knew so much about her because we had interviewed all these other people (laughs) about her that we knew exactly what we wanted to ask. Jim Jenkins, the creator of Doug, was also one of the last ones that we did. 
and you know he was also somebody that was instrumental in pinwheel one of the early yeah. shows that was so, amazing do you remember pinwheel i remember pinwheel i remember when it was a show on nickelodeon i don't remember when the network was just called pinwheel and that was it mm. Yeah, I only remember when it was a show. Also, I when you when you guys showed the turtle, holy nostalgia! I, my yeah. like <laughs> my li- I was born in eighty one, so I don't even know how old I was when that show was out. But I I was like it w- there was corners of my brain that were like, no, that turtle. I knew I know that. Turtle. Yes, totally. I, know, I, know, so I, I was yeah. like, wow. I loved that show, and I loved plus and minus. I thought they were way cooler than Bert and Ernie because they were like kids and they had like. <laughs> Pinwheel was kind of like Sesame Street, but it focused more on like imagination than like just learning, just hardcore. Here's your ABCs. Here's your numbers. Here's addition. It was more imagination. But because of all that other stuff, we were we knew that he was instrumental in Pinwheel. So we were able to get him to talk about that. So it, I would say it is kind of cool to do some interviews early and then some interviews later because then you know where you're missing like we by the time we did like uh, we did like one final round of interviews where it was like Geraldine Laybourne and Drake Bell and Vanessa Coffey, who was executive producer of all the Nicktoons and oh, is amazing human being. And then uh, Jim Jenkins, creator of Doug, we interviewed all those like a year later than the rest. So it really helped us fill in. We already knew where the gaps were. So mm-hmm. that really helped us. Her part of the documentary was, I, I was blown away, you know, to think that, right. It was Rugrats, Doug, and then Ren and Stimpy or something yeah. like that that trifecta of animation coming out of Nickelodeon. I was just like, you can't get a better, like th- you couldn't get yes. better, three better cartoons cre- and brand new. And that's the other thing, like what was great about Nickelodeon, what watching this documentary was just like how much Nickelodeon, it was just all original con like the original content. It was like an original content machine. It was just yeah. like, we're going to make this like ours and, and just constant. And it was, and the imagination that went into it, but also the freedom to kind of make yeah. shows um, and for creators to like have so much of a say as well. Um, and that collaboration between um, yeah. uh, creator and executive and so on and so forth. And it was like very team oriented. I, I was really, it was really amazing to kind of see that. You don't think that like, especially with, television and movies that that kind of collaboration is happening because it's a money maker this was like right you know we're creating something together yeah they were breaking new ground they were writing the rules and that was one thing that we really wanted to stress in the film is you know now nickelodeon is nickelodeon it's this big yeah. thing <laughs> and shows you know like like doug and rugrats there's lots of cool cartoons you know there's steven universe craig of the creek um gravity falls and then for adults there's you know rick and morty and uh, Bob's Burger, stuff like that is all over the place now. Really cool animation is going on right now. And Nickelodeon with the Nicktoons is kind of where it started yeah. because before that, the only cartoons were, there were no cartoons that were kind of for adults and kids at the same time, like Adventure Time and all that stuff. Right. Um, and they were the first people to do that. And also to make a cartoon that was really a cartoon and not just a commercial for a toy. That That's was right. always, oh. you've got a toy, how do you mar- market this toy? You put a cartoon out. Literally, the cartoon is an afterthought. It was just a way to sell toys. And Nickelodeon was one of the first people to do that. And it's one of those things where you don't think about it now because it's everywhere. Mm. It's like, these are the people you have to thank for that. Yeah. That was one of my favorite parts of the documentary where they said at first, you know, obviously, like you said, now Nickelodeon's a marketing machine. But like before that, and it, and it, it speaks to the, the documentary of why these were the golden slash orange years, like yeah. the, because they weren't trying to sell us anything. They were just right. trying to make us just give kids things to watch and be yeah. happy about and stuff. And then it's like, it, it that kind of speaks to like why maybe that's why the, it was so great because they weren't thinking about, what toy they needed to promote right. that that week or, or yeah. month or year? Or what's next? Or we got to build the you know the Batman or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle thing or whatever. So we got to put them in a scuba gear. And it's like what? <laughs> and then yeah. like you know, I thought I thought that was awesome to see. And then all of a sudden, see how everyone started to leave once things turned into the marketing machine. And not that they, yeah. they, they ate it, but it's like well inevitably like it it's fine because like i think about it as a small business that i am I'm like we're a small nano brewery eventually like 
the the projection is that you want to continue to get better, bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually it's like, well, do you, does your quality go down so you can make, become more successful or do you stay where yeah. you're at? So it's like, unfortunately they have investors and the investors are like, exactly. Well, now yeah. we're here and we've plateaued. Where do we do now? Toys. And it's like, yeah. log. Like, you know, yeah. you know, which by the way, I, it's, it's, I still think that the log song, I still sing that log song. For yeah. Me. It's yeah. great. I mean, yeah. come on. How yeah. classic is that? Yeah. You know, it's so it. good. Yeah. So yeah. the cartoons were sick. They were, so they were. Good. and like you said, Dan, like those three, the trifecta, yeah. I love how they think they, they say like the Rugrats, they were ugly babies and they're like, yes, yes babies are cute. And yeah. they all weird and stuff. And like, I love the drawing. The illustration of it was great. The, and just like, I can't tell you which of the three I like more though. Mm, yeah. yeah, that's really hard. That's really <laughs> hard. They're all great in their own way. And isn't yeah. that crazy though? You know, usually you have a couple of missteps and mm-hmm. then you hit it big. But literally Vanessa Coffey said, I think you should make Nick, you should make cartoons, your own cartoons. Cause like you said, in the early days, Nickelodeon just bought cartoons from other people. Like they played Looney Tunes or Mighty Mouse or whatever. But she said, you should make your own. And they said, cool, go find us some cartoons. And literally the first three were Doug, Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy. Like she hit three home runs. Those shows are still huge to this day. If you go into like a, like a Hot Topic or like Urban Outfitters or whatever like the trendy store is for like young people, those shirts are still there, like oh, still yeah. to this day. Yeah. yeah. Um, those, those three won't, those I three. don't think will ever go away. No, yeah. I don't. I mean, no. and then, like, <laughs> yeah, Rocco is like considered like the honorary fourth mm. original one because it came out right after those. Right. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's great. But Doug, Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy and Ren and Stimpy. That's a perfect example. That show was on Nickelodeon and MTV literally at the same time. Yeah. That so, show was amazing. And I love how they opened up being like, we didn't really know what some of this stuff was. And they were just like throwing these jokes in there. Yeah. That yeah no yeah. one knew was like getting past everybody. And I was just like, yeah. But as a kid, you don't know. Then all of a sudden as an adult, you hear these things like, wow, they let that they let that go right through. Like that right. was happening. <laughs> I know <Okay>. totally. <laughs> it's crazy that and, yeah. and it's a, I will plug it. There's a great Ren and Stimpy documentary out there that's that I think is great. If you like the orange years, I think a great companion piece is Happy, Happy, Joy, Joy. Uh, it's very different because the orange years is very much like a triumphant, like super fun film, uh, get you pumped up. And Happy, Happy, D- Joy, Joy is much more of a dark, uh, mm. but it's, I mean, it's a fantastic film. And it's all about, it's just about Ren and Stimpy. Just wow. about. Wow. Okay. Wow. Um, I, I thought it was interesting that they were part of another an ensemble of animals and like yeah she's tr- she's like no no just the dog and the cat just these guys yeah just those two like yeah. put those into a show i was like oh, that, that, that shows cool. you how genius she was Van- oh. vanessa coffee she she first of all the fact that she could see talent she could spot talent because mm-hmm. of the hundreds of different people that came in doug rugarts and ren stimpy those are the three she chose and she also kind of helped shape them all like like you mentioned, uh, you know, Ren and Stimpy was originally going to be this huge gang. I think it was called Our Gang. It was either yeah. Our Gang or Your Gang. And it was this big group of a bunch of people. And she's like, no, 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 no. Focus on the cat and dog and that's something. And obviously she was 100% right, you know. And uh, Rugrats, the same way. You know, those, um, Klasky Chupo is the animation company that created uh, Rugrats. And they went on to do a bunch of other stuff like Ah Real Monsters. They've done three or four other cartoons for Nickelodeon afterwards. Uh, they did the original Simpsons when it was on the Tracy Ullman show. Oh, Whoa. you know what? That makes a lot of sense. That's yeah. so good. Now I, I see and that. They, wow. Yeah, when it got picked up by Fox, they were like, eh, we don't really want to do that. <laughs> Whoops. I mean, you can look at that either way. Like, Oops. Yeah. <laughs> or, but, then they, but then they also did go on to do their own cool stuff. You know, they had three or four ideas that, mm. uh, that Vanessa Coffey was like, nope, nope, nope. And finally, like, well, I mean, the only other idea we got, we don't even have any drawings or a script. We don't have anything. It's just an idea we came up with. Um, is like a bunch of babies that whenever the adults uh, leave the room, they talk and she's like, that, do that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, they didn't have, yeah. there were no drawings, there were no characters. It was just, wow. that's what they said. It's a show about babies that can talk whenever the adults leave the room. And she's like, boom, go for it. And then look what happened. Unbelievable. What's funny is, while well, this is being recorded, we released a new episode today about guts. 
And um, yeah, and like that too, like we were talking about game shows like and stuff and how Double Dare, just like that show was amazing. Mark Summers, first of yeah. all, though, but I just want to say Mark Summers, <laughs> the stuff that he said in your documentary, just I laughed out loud every time when he said he ripped the microphones out of that thing. Oh and my the, gosh, the, I know, yeah. <laughs> he is gold. He is gold. And, and I'm so glad. What was it like? Was he like very, I mean, it seemed like he was very like open and forthright with the, Yeah, interview. he was awesome. He was great. And what's even cooler is, you know, um, I mentioned Happy Happy Joy Joy. He's got a documentary that's still coming out, um, wow. but he was working on it at the same time as us and he's still doing it. And it's about his life uh, mm. and it's called On Your Mark. Oh, um, yeah. And, it, and it deals with with his life. I mean, he's led a crazy life. He was a comedian. Yeah. He was a magician. And then, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, he was on Nickelodeon. Uh, it's funny. People either know him as Double Dare or the Unwrapped guy. Like a lot of people really know him from Unwrapped, which is a Food Network show. And, uh, you know, he's dealt with OCD, obsessive yeah. compulsive disorder. And now he's doing like a one man show. He's an amazing guy. And he was like, yeah, I'm going to give you all stuff that's not in my documentary. So you can only imagine like the stuff that he gave us was so gold. What's wow. going to be in his own, you know? Wow. Yeah, he's that's crazy because he gave up a lot of things. Like when he yeah. talked about the kid who got hurt, yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> whoops. Yeah. <laughs> Like, God, that was that would not fly nowadays. You want to talk about nostalgia? Yeah, we've actually put that double dare to the test too on uh, so one of our episodes, and th- we've said it. We said it was it was so low budget, but so yep. much fun, and how crazy! Like w- we said that Mark Summers was so wi- like Dan like loves how like quick he was. Like yeah, like was like yeah. all right, move on. He was so all quick, right. and what I think made him so awesome. You know, I couldn't have put this into words as a kid because I didn't understand it, but now looking at it is. He, he treated that game, that game show, Double Dare, the same way uh, you would treat a game show with adults. Yeah. He, he acted exactly the same. He, it was like he wasn't even talking to a kid. The same way that like Bob Barker or Pat Sajak or Alex Trebek, he put the same professionalism. He wasn't like, okay, little Billy, are you ready to do the physical <laughs> challenge? He wasn't. He was, he was, I mean, you look at him and you can't even tell he's talking to kids. He's just speaking to them the same way and that's what made that show so awesome he didn't wear a wacky costume with a weird bow tie he just wore regular clothes and i think subconsciously kids picked up on that of like mm. oh sh- you're treating me the same way you would treat my mom or dad cool like i'll watch you i'll, I'll invest in you yeah yeah I, I remember watching it as a kid and that's what i love that part because it wasn't like we keep like we said in the beginning like it, it wasn't talking down to me it could have been as crazy as it is like yes with all the double dare stuff you <laughs> like getting getting dirty doing these things throwing ping That's pong so balls expensive. that stuff yeah. or spraying people in the face with whip- all that stuff can fly it doesn't matter because he was just treating everybody yes. you know like like a person not yeah. like yeah hey, like you said like hey little billy blah blah he was just like yep welcome to double dare let's do this what do you want to do you want to take a physical <laughs> challenge you know yeah. <laughs> yeah he was awesome the yeah. best is how fast like the, <laughs> there was one time in the beginning we we saw some episodes where like if a trick if a physical challenge wasn't working he was just like move on like he just, <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yeah, okay, you won. it's good. over you got like, it. okay that's good move like, you know, you and it, to- D- double dare is one of those shows where i think it does hold up absolutely it's awesome it's a great show the you know and they did do a um, a revival they they rebooted double dare recently and i think i mean i i have no idea because i'm not in with nickelodeon even though i made this doc so i don't <laughs> know why it it, it it only lasted a couple of seasons mm. but if i had to guess it's just that the culture kind of changed. Mm. Kids aren't as into that as we were. Right. You know what I mean? Like young kids aren't as into like trivia as we were. Mm. And I think some of that is, and again, this isn't good or bad. It's just simply the way it is. You know, is it like, you know, if back in like, let's say you're hanging out with your friends in 1995, you know, and you're like, who was that dude in that movie? Who was that guy in that movie? You know, and none of your friends know. And you're like, I know it was Steve Buscemi. You know, you looked awesome because you're the guy that knew it. Now yeah. it's like, who is that guy in the movie? Oh, it doesn't man. matter because we have the ability to look anything up on our phone. So the idea of having a bunch of knowledge in your brain doesn't really matter. You don't need to. So that's no. all I can guess is just mm. that it, it wasn't as kids don't really connect. I've noticed like my kids, because I have little kids and I watched all the old Nickelodeon shows with them. And for whatever reason, you know, they thought the physical challenges were cool. 
but they really didn't like the questions. They just didn't care. Yeah. Uh, they kind of, I could, I watch them zone out at that part. That's funny. You said that there are times that when Dan and I are doing this thing, we're like, oh, we sound so old, but I'm just like, the way I said it with double dare was that there's so much content now that kids could just pick up and yeah. just like watch something else. Yeah. Like you said, like that, yeah. I never, I didn't think about the question thing. I was thinking more about they've seen gross. They've yeah, seen true. They've seen this. They've seen so many other things. Kids are doing so many. They'll sit and watch kids play video games. And I'm just like, yeah, but like, you're right about the, it's almost like useless knowledge that you had that friend that, you know, yeah. Right off the duck. Uh, you had that friend <laughs> that um, knew everything or it, it, what I loved about that kind of question of like, who was in that movie or what was that show was that, you had about an hour of conversation with your friends trying to figure it out. Figure it out, yeah. Now it's, hold on, this is it. No, and then the conversation's over and then you're not really hanging out with your friends anymore because all you're doing is like, Oh, that's a, that's a, that's the job for Google. And it's like, wait, that's a job for us just to talk. Like, yeah. Gave us like a chance to hang out with each other and be the person, you know, now it's like, I'll just Google it. It's like, what? Like, come on. It takes the fun out of it for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Your whole like social skills get to be like destroyed a little bit because of it. You know, like you, no one's like trying to go through the six degrees of like, yeah, he was in that. No, I think he was he that. That's not the same guy. That's not. (laughs) Yeah. So guys, if you like um, nostalgia test podcast, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Yeah, subscribe and like. like Follow us on all social media outlets that you can find us and where you can get podcasts. Podbean, Spotify, I've <laughs> Apple. <laughs> well, Scott, did you end? Did you ever go to the Nickelodeon Studios and Universal? Uh, that I, no, I never did. I, I wish I could have, especially now. After working on the dock and watching all these other people, who I we uh, some of our, one of our producers, Sean Coffin, he did go and he he filmed it. So we used some of his footage in the movie. So watching his vacation and stuff, it's like, oh damn it, this oh. I wish I could go, but I never oh. got to. Wow, that's what that was because I was wondering. I'm like, I wonder where they got some of this footage, and that's amazing that that was like home videos. Of yeah, we got it all things. over the place. Like, um, oh. we got it from like old promos, and then we also like I would just find YouTube, and if I saw somebody with some cool clips, I'd email and be like, Hey, can I can I use some of your clips in my movie? Oh, uh, wow. the, mo- the majority of them are always like, Yeah, sure, I don't care. Just throw me up in the end credits, and you can use whatever yeah. you want. That's so, awesome. I always yeah. wanted to go. I remember, and I never went to Universal Studios and I was like, oh man, I can't wait to go there and try to, I always, there was a thing with me and you probably found this out. Like I always, I told Dan, I was like, most of the kids on the show are probably actors that just needed like extras that needed the job. And I was like, did, did real kids actually go on the shows? Did they, I don't, I was like questioning it. I was like, that kid was probably trying to get a job on a commercial. And they were like, (laughs) Hey, go and double dare. And I was like, I can't believe that they're real. So were they, I guess they were real, like kids? Yeah, like the contestants on the show. Yeah. Yeah, they were. They were just wow. regular kids. Um, wow. Well, there was, an, I know that there was the episode that Mark was like, we're live on Double Dare and you could yeah. come here too and audition. And I was like, wait, that was real? Like, I literally thought it was just, you know, some actors yeah. who needed work. So. There probably were some people that wanted to get into show business that were trying to get on the show for that. Like uh, AJ McLean, McLean from uh, Back in Sync, one of those bands, he was on an episode of Guts. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you can look it up oh, if you look up like AJ uh, McLean. I think it's McLean. I always say it wrong, uh, uh, but he was on an episode of Guts. So uh, maybe that was because you know he had an agent. Like, oh, you should go yeah. on a, you should go yeah. on a, a game show. Anything to be in front of the camera. Well, sure. like some some of the people from some of the other shows too on on Nickelodeon yeah. were on like Hidden Temple or Arcade. Which when I saw the clips from Arcade from Nickel, I was just like, I, I, I it just brought me back immediately. I was like, oh wow, that's how they did that. Like the everything was in a blue screen, and you had to. I mean, it was just amazing how they thought these things up um, to kind of even create some of that. And Hidden Temple, I have to say, is probably one of the greatest game shows have, have to be like ever created, like ever. Yeah. Like that was one of the greatest things I've ever seen. But it's yeah. funny what Scott said about the trivia thing. I think that show won't hold up right now because uh, kids uh, would just be like, I just want to see them run through the temple. 
I don't want to solve all these questions and stuff. Cause like there was a lot of questions in the hidden temple thing. There were, yeah. <laughs> so I've seen a couple episodes because Dan, I wanted to put it to the test one time. I'm like, let me just watch this. I'm like, whoa, like there's a there's a lot to just to get to the temple. It's like yeah, there yeah. are. It was yeah. great though. Some of the what other stuff when we were talking about how like kids nowadays, like whether these things will, you know, resonate with them. And I think about some of the, the you know, uh, original live action should like original shows that they created. And I'm like trying to think like what would Clarissa explains it all like translate like, you know, cause I mean, that show was great. Melissa Joan Hart, like the, the interview did you guys did with her really opened up like this whole world of that show. And also how, all of these kind of shows also and how diverse the the cast were and how a lot of the shows were lead, led um, by, you know, girls as well as the main characters. I, and it was like telling these other stories that we weren't getting. And nowadays, like you kind of see like almost like a scale back on that. And almost like when I saw Clarissa, I was like, it almost reminded me of Blossom and that, and that mm -hmm. idea of like, she's telling her story, she's breaking the fourth wall. And it's like, but she's also, I like I just said, like she's not interested in the kid that's climbing through her window. She's like an independent feminist. Like when I said, like Clarissa yeah. explains all the feminists, I was like, that makes so much sense. That was like such an eye-opening like moment in the in the doc. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that I mean, that was an important show, yeah. you know. And, and I think that's funny that that that's another example of how Nickelodeon just broke all the rules. They nowadays it's all about a formula and buzzwords. Like even in the limited experience I've had, people like. You can tell they're taking like when we're trying to sell the orange years, people like nostalgia, 90s, Nickelodeon. They put that into a computer and see how much money they can make out of it, you know, whether or not they want to buy it. And wow. they did they did the opposite of that back then, you mm -hmm. know, where it's like Clarissa explains it all. Like everyone was saying this show is going to fail because everyone back in the day said boys will not watch a show where a girl is the main character. They just yeah. won't. And that was like the rule. That was like the rule of of kids programming and uh and nickelodeon was like yeah they will specific specifically you know geraldine layborn and her team were like yeah they will they will they, they just you've never tried it you've never made a good show that's the problem let's do it let's make a badass show and uh and boys will totally watch it and i totally did i loved clarissa i loved alex mack both <laughs> of those shows i loved and i never i never even thought about it as, as a young boy i was never like oh i'm watching a girl show i never even thought of it like mm. that like yeah it was amazing and it's awesome yeah, that's it's funny how like when uh, Geraldine her approach to everything. I think for me the the thing that stuck with me the most was her approach, like her confidence and yes. the the way she just was like, "We're doing this, no matter what, right?" Like yeah. doing this, and it really put like for me right up front, being like, "Well, without her, that this doesn't like there's no way that these things happen." Like she really had a vision. Absolutely. Yeah. She just moved forward with that. 100%. It wouldn't have happened without her. You know, because, and we show that what Nickelodeon was like before that, where it was kind of like a low budget PBS. It was on yeah. its way out. <laughs> and, and really, whenever we were doing research, uh, when we found out about her pretty early, you know, because she's a huge part of Nickelodeon. But when we were, when I realized that the same person was president and responsible for, you can't do that on television, mm -hmm. which is one of the first shows I ever saw all, yeah. the, all the way back in the, the <sighs> early 80s. All the way through all that and Keenan and Kel, it was the same person guiding it through all of that. That's when I was like, oh, my God, you know, like, yeah. that's I, I really want to do this movie. That's whenever I got really excited about it. I was like, I really want to do this movie. I really want to tell this person's story because that's freaking crazy. Like she shaped a whole generation. There was nothing like that before. And really, I mean, there's nothing like it afterwards. But no. you can definitely see how much stuff was influenced by her for sure. Oh, yeah. Even Pete, Pete. When I saw when oh. we were showing clips of Pete, Pete, uh, and the, uh, the, I think there was a description of it being like a Twin Peaks type of. Yeah, I was just like, holy, yeah, it's a totally. Yeah, it was just the way it kind of like played out. Th those two guys too, like th that interview was really awesome because mm. it, it really, it really explained a lot, but also like it just showed how much imagination and being yeah. imaginative and free. Yeah was so important to making these shows successful. When you yeah. think about it, when you say, I love 80s and 90s Nickelodeon, or even just 90s, let's just say 90s, I love 90s Nickelodeon. What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. You know, like Pete and Pete, which is this very surreal, like Wes Anderson and Twin Peaks <laughs> had a baby. It's just very weird show. 
Are You Afraid of the Dark, which is like a horror show, Ren oh, and God. Stimpy, which is like a weird, demented cartoon, <laughs> uh, Salute Your Shorts, which is kids oh. at camp, Clarissa, uh, Double Dare, Nick Arcade. None of these shows are like each other at all. No. You know what I mean? That And that's, no. I think, the beauty of when you say I love 90s Nickelodeon, there, it, it means so many different things because they, they definitely did not have a pattern that they continued. Mm. All of those shows are totally different. Like, find any two shows that were similar. There's not. They're all, they're all different. They, weren't, they were constantly trying new things. They weren't like, oh, let's do, uh, you know, we did a show about Clarissa. Let's do a show about another girl. Like, or, you know, oh, we got a show like that's kind of like about horror. Let's do another horror show. Or like, it was yeah. always different, you know? Cause I mean, even, you know, the two shows that really from that point that, that, that had really strong female leads, Clarissa and Alex Mack, those shows are nothing alike, you know? <gasps> Clarissa was like a multicam sitcom about an everyday uh, girl. Alex Mack was like a single cam, more cinematic show about a girl that was like a superhero. Uh, this kind of had action, mystery. I mean, those shows were nothing alike. None of the shows were anything alike. They were always doing something different. I, mm. That's what blows me away the most. Mm. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I, was, I was really happy that you got um, a lot of people from all that. And yeah. the Keen wow. Show, I was like, wow. Man. Like that, oh, what's his name? Uh, no, Keenan. Keenan. You oh, got Keenan. Keenan. Yeah. Keenan Thompson, yeah. Like, you know, this guy is like right now on Saturday. Oh, I know. Like, killing yeah. it. Like, killing it on Saturday Night Live. When I know. He came on Saturday Night Live. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so happy for him. And it was because, like, I knew him growing up. Like, yeah. You know, I felt like I was friends with him. I would be <laughs> watching those shows all the time. And yes. I'm like, I was so happy to see him in Saturday Night Live. I'm like, he belongs there. Like, this guy was. Yeah genius growing up and Big now time. he's there and the fact that he said i was like he must have really been happy to sit down because he's got to know that his career is because of nickelodeon like yeah. nickelodeon helped him oh like, yeah be where he is right now i mean the first thing i have to say is keenan thompson was just the nicest person like it's so refreshing whenever good things happen to good people you know and that guy like you said he's blowing up now he's got his own tv show you know yeah We've been yeah. on Saturday Night Live longer than anybody in the history of SNL. Um, I mean, he just hosted the Kids Show Choice Awards on Nickelodeon. You know, to get to sit down with him and talk with him uh, on our very small indie film, you know, uh, was amazing. And he was so nice and so gracious. I could not say enough good things about him. And I think that also shows the power of Nickelodeon. You know, there are people like Keenan Thompson, who's one of the biggest stars in the world. Christine Taylor, who, you know... Yeah. was married to Ben Stiller, was in the Brady Bunch movie, Dodgeball, a huge A-list star. Uh, Graham Yost, who wrote for Hey Dude, who went on to write <laughs> Speed, Band of Brothers. I, I know. Um, That's crazy. You know, Ann Sweeney, who is like one of the higher ups at like Netflix now and like lives in a huge mansion. All of these people like could have easily been like, hey guys, good luck, but I, I don't have time for a little small mm -hmm. documentary for free. You know, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa Joan Hart, you know, she's still killing it. She was, directing, yeah. she was directing uh, an episode of the Goldbergs whenever we interviewed her. Oh, um, really? Yeah. So, I mean, it shows you how powerful Nickelodeon was that all of these really powerful, important, successful people were still willing to talk about it because mm -hmm. it meant that much to them. Just the same way it meant something to us watching it, it meant so much to them for getting to be a part of it. Mm. That feels really good. That, that's, that's, that, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I'm really happy yeah. you said that, that they're still like, I wanted to ask you, like, did you have to talk to Nickelodeon and tell them that you're doing a documentary? So, yeah, the funny thing is there's something called fair use that we, we researched. We read a book on it and we talked to some other people and then we actually hired the guy who wrote the book uh, <laughs> to be our lawyer. Um, <laughs> really? talk, yeah. <laughs> it's called fair use. And I think it's one reason why like documentaries are really booming right now is you can make a documentary on anything and show clips from it mm. and you just have to cite fair use. And you, you, there are laws like how long you can play clips and you have to get a lawyer to sign off on it and get insurance. So it's not like it's super easy, yeah. but it's certainly easier than paying like $30,000 for every five second clip, you know? Like you see how many clips we use in the movie and they were all oh, yeah. fair use, all wow. fair use. Really? Uh, like I said, we did have to pay for a lawyer uh, to, to sign off and say, I approve and say that this is all fair use. Uh, and then we had to get insurance for that as well. So it wasn't, wow. 
it wasn't totally easy, but it was easy compared to, like I said, paying thousands of dollars for hundreds of thousands of dollars. But one of the things that they told us was just because you legally can do something, just because you legally can do it, doesn't mean that you should be like a jerk about it, you know? So they said, we always recommend you reaching out to people first and saying, this is what we're doing. We're doing it. Do you want to be a part of it? If not, no big deal. I just want to let you know that I'm doing this. Hmm. So we sent Nickelodeon uh, an email just saying like, hey, we're doing this. <laughs> love, love to have you be a part of it. And they were just like, didn't even respond. They're like, yeah, whatever. They're like, uh, we, we sell GAC now. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But what's funny is, you know, it, there was a happy ending there because, you know, they just kind of didn't really care about us and threw a couple of weird things our way. Uh, and then at the very end, a guy named Brian Robbins became the president of Nickelodeon. Right as our movie was wrapping up, hmm. Brian Robbins, who was a writer on all that, oh, became wow. the president of Nickelodeon. And he's one of the biggest Jerry Laybourne fanboys of all time. Hmm. Uh, under his watch, Double Dare came back, all that came back, and uh, now Rugrats is coming back, and Are You Afraid of the Dark has come back. So clearly he has reverence for the orange years. And wow. he reached out to us and was very nice and was like, oh, I, wow. I, I think this is cool. I'm glad that you guys are doing it. I just want to let you know there's no opposition from us. Like, we support what you're doing. And that was huge. That was huge. That's because, huge, wow. yeah. You know, when you're trying to sell this movie, there are people like Hulu that buy – I mean, Grant, I know now that Hulu is owned by – disney or whatever but before that you know <laughs> like everything's owned by disney now. i was gonna say but, what is not owned by what is not, not but you know like there are places that buy stuff from nickelodeon that have a working relationship that with nickelodeon that right. maybe would be hesitant to do business with us because it's like eh, if i buy this unauthorized nickelodeon story is nickelodeon gonna get mad at me and not want to mm -hmm. sell to me or something like that right. so being able to go in to meetings with distributors and plat streaming platforms saying the president of Nickelodeon, Brian Robbins is totally cool with this. It, he, mm. he gives his stamp of approval. It, it meant a lot to us. Wow. So it started wow. out somewhat antagonistic and ended up like super positive and awesome. Did you just do this for since 2017? Are you working like your production company? You guys obviously have a production company or is it, is it both of you guys or just a, a group of you guys that have this production company yeah this film was kind of interesting it was like a bunch of different people that all have their own stuff going on came together to work on this so we all have our own stuff and um we all pretty much have day jobs so we were doing this in our off time uh for sure i luckily um i have a day job that is in the same business shooting and editing so that made it really easy and really flexible for me to be able to do the movie Wow. That's cool. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was good. Cause I was like, man, there's no way they were surviving just on crowdfunding. And yeah, no way. I mean, we got like, we got $12,000 from that crowdfunding. Oh, wow. Not a lot. Jeez, man. Um, you know, like, and honestly, the majority of it was legal fees. Cause like I said, you know, <laughs> you, you, fair use, it's cheaper than buying the clip. Cause realistically, I have a good friend. I don't want to say good friend. I, I'm a fan of this guy and now I know who he is. So he, I consider him a friend, even though he might say something <laughs> different. He's like, oh yeah, that little nerdy Nickelodeon guy. But a guy named Randall Lobb. Uh, Randall Lobb is just a fantastic director. He directed uh, a movie called Turtle Power, which is a documentary about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he also directed a He-Man documentary called Power of Grey Skull. Wow, uh, and he's just this, both of those. <laughs> they're great. They're great. Turtle Power is great. Turtle Power is so much better than the... Um, toys that made us episode oh, really of turtles it's like that but like times Even a better. million way oh, better okay. yeah randall awesome. lobb is a, a super talented guy anyway I, you know i talked to him and he did his documentary before fair use kind of was becoming more mainstream and yeah. he was telling me like because you know he had to play clips from the cartoon the ninja turtles cartoon he had to play clips from the ninja turtles movie from you know universal all this stuff and he was like i mean it was like crazy amounts of money for each for like a five yeah. second clip, he was playing, yeah. he was paying like so much money. Whereas you know we just paid a lawyer one fee to go over it and say, and and you look at the movie. I mean, we play clips left and right. The, you do. Yeah, we play so many clips, and we didn't have to license them, but we did have to pay a hefty fee because we wanted a good lawyer and and travel. I mean, uh, travel and legal fees were mainly what we did because you know we shot it. We used all of my equipment to film it for the most part. There were some times where we hired another camera person. But uh, and we just stayed on people's couches, you know, <laughs> uh, 
and used whatever location we could. We were really scrappy. I'm really proud of how, how much we did with so little, but yeah, I mean, $12,000. Yeah. There's no way two or three people can go no. off that for a couple of years, especially like I said, the majority of it went right to travel and lawyers. That's where pretty much all that money went because we went to, we went to Los Angeles twice. We went to New York once we went to Canada once. Wow. Uh, and we went to Toronto and Ottawa. And then we went to, we took a special trip to Nashville and then we took a special trip to Georgia and that was it. But, and uh, you guys yeah. are like best, are you guys like close friends? Yeah. You know, Adam Sweeney and I, we were friends back when these shows were on, we watched those shows oh, together. Wow. It was a big, really? that was kind of why we wanted to do it. Yeah. So it was, it was a blast. You know? And you're both in film or are you just like, only you are and he's just he does other things yeah we both were you know adam is a really talented journalist and a really talented writer and i shoot stuff and i edit and that's kind of why we decided we wanted to do a documentary was it kind of seemed like it could put both of our skills yeah. to good use and so we we kind of used our our skills together to this is your this first documentary it was my first feature length film I've ever done. Both of wow. us. Oh, wow. Um, so, yeah. Scott, doc- this is an amazing feature length film. <laughs> yeah, thank you. you know. oh, thank like, you. Yeah. I was blown away by it. Blown yeah. away. I just want to. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the clips, the, the way you set it up, the, 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 everything, the storytelling of it is so, mm-hmm. it's so good. It's like yeah. unbelievably good. I, I love that you got that story from Keenan for about Coolio. For oh, that. my gosh. Oh, my yes. gosh. <laughs> Oh, shit. that was the greatest. Story. <laughs> and then Coolio, and then you got Coolio. Like to me, like I think, like we keep saying it. That's the power of that moment of Nickelodeon. That I know. Like, of course, I want well, to talk about that. That was like, uh, you know, me. yeah, you know, to to kind of tack onto that point, Nickelodeon didn't talk down to kids. All that was very much like a Saturday Night Live or In Living Color, but for kids. But the musical guests they got were still adults. It's yeah. not like they were getting little kids. Like, okay, we got to get Hanson and, uh, you know, another bad creation. And that's all we could get <laughs> as little kids. Like they got, I mean, it was like freaking Coolio, TLC, um, you know, people like that, like legit, like yeah. grown up adult people. The fact that we got Coolio was so amazing. That's awesome. Like, that shows you the power. <laughs> we just, we hit him up and we're like, hey man, um, you want to be in this Nickelodeon documentary? Like he's done so many other things with his life. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that like when Weird Al has parodied one of your songs, you're legit Americana. Like you are a big yeah. deal if, if Weird Al parodies you. And he's had a Weird Al parody his song. And we just hit him up and we're like, hey, man, um, we see you're going to be in L.A. Um, can we do a quick interview about Keenan and Kel and all that? And he's like, yeah, man, I'm going to be at my hotel from about this time to this time. Swing on by and we'll just do it. And he totally did what? it. You know, he just was like, yeah, come on by. That's fine. Dude, and he that's was like, awesome. Did you was just, so nice. did, you, did you be like, yo, can you sing Gangsta's Paradise? Just, just, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> that's amazing. Wow. Wow. Like, what a cool guy. Two, you know, three, I mean, cool. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That story with uh, Dan, like you said, that story was great when he's like, <laughs> that, we're all kids around and you smell like a billowing of marijuana. <laughs> yeah. And the kid uh, to kind of tack onto that story, it's not in the movie, but they talked. Uh, Keenan and Lori Beth both talked about that a little bit more. Is you know all that the the cast members were a pretty wide gap from like the oldest to the youngest, mm. and also not just that, but it's it's where every year counts. You you know like you think about it, there might have been some people that were like twelve or thirteen when they were on all that, and then some people might have been like seventeen or eighteen. That's very different. You know that's yeah. a very different point in your life, and you could tell like. The little kids are like, what's that smell? And the older kids are like, oh, I know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> like were, they said there was this very clear line between the kids that were like young. were like, what's that weird smell? Did a skunk get in here or what? And like the older kids are like, oh. it was almost like a rite of passage. Like, it, do you know what that smell is? Yes or no? What's that weird smell coming from Coolio's dressing room? If you oh. know what it is, you're officially a cool kid. That's yeah. hilarious. That's amazing. Oh my God. Wow. I can't believe you got that interview just like that. Just like, wow. I can't either. And you know, one thing I, I got to give props to so many people because, you know, I feel like it's yeah. always like the directors of movies that get propped up. And the, the analogy that I use for this movie is that a- Adam and I are kind of like Sam and Frodo. I don't know if you guys are Lord of the Rings fans. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings <laughs> dork, but um, you know, like it, Sam and Frodo, it started out as a small thing in the Shire 
but then we quickly got a fellowship of all these other amazing people that uh that worked on it you know one of the first people that came on board was a guy named sean Cawthon. he's another texas guy adam and i are both from texas and another texas guy uh named sean Cawthon was like hey i see what you're doing like y'all need somebody else i'm really good with a camera and he had worked on some tv shows like mtv uh and stuff like that and we're like yeah sure come on he seemed like a real cool dude like so we're like yeah come on man let's do it let's let's uh let's bring you on and uh, i learned so much from him he really was he he's credited as our cinematographer i mean he really did so much more than that oh, but cool. uh he's credited as our cinematographer because he kind of shot the most of it and kind of set the vibe for how it was going to look uh yeah. and he's one of the first people and then uh i saw a documentary um a guy named Tommy Avalone, who's a, a become a real, real good friend of mine. Again, I would consider him, Tommy, if you're listening, I consider you a good friend. I hope you consider the same of me. But uh, Tommy Avalone had worked on a documentary um, called Ghost Heads. That's about Ghostbuster fandom and, Ghost, and Ghostbusters the movie. Wow. And uh, Tommy couldn't work on the documentary because he was working on something that was kind of competing. And I wish with all my heart I could have worked with Tommy, but I am working on a doc with Tommy now. Nice. Um, and I swear I, I won't go off on any more tangents, but and that's a nostalgia test tangent. Tommy introduced oh, it's okay. the two we, other we guys here. <laughs> uh, to two other guys who are much like uh, Dan and Manny. You guys on both coasts. One was a New York guy, and one was an LA guy who both worked on Ghost Heads with him, Lee Leshin and Bill Parks. Um, they came on board as producers. So when we were in LA, Bill kind of helped us out, and when we were in New York, Lee kind of helped us out. And those That's- guys helped us out a lot. Yeah. And we, when we interviewed Elisa Reyes, who was awesome, she was on all that. She's amazing. She's like, hey, guys, I want in. And we're like, what do you mean? She's like, I don't want to just be interviewed. I want to be part of this. This is good. Oh, Nobody wow. had asked us that before that. She was the first person to do it. And she goes, I want to be a producer. Let me, let me, let me come on board and I'm going to help you. And so we're like, okay, cool. Yeah. Like, we, help us book some interviews. Like, not even joking. The next day, she's like, hey, I talked to Keenan Thompson, Kel Mitchell. Uh, Larissa Olenek, that's Alex Mack, uh, Phil Moore. Uh, they're all close personal friends of mine and they all said they'll do it. <laughs> like, wow. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. No, nah, man, it uh, takes a village to, it to make a, a film. It and does. All those people, they helped us out uh, so much. And, and then Lee Leshin, uh, once we had that trailer cut that I was telling you about that debuted at New York City Comic Con, he's like, hey, can I show this to my friend, uh, Adam F. Goldberg? Can I show it to him? And we're like, you mean Adam F. Goldberg from like, the show, the Goldbergs. And he's like, yeah, he's a, a friend of mine. I, I worked on him on another documentary oh, called wow. back in time. And we're like, yeah, you can definitely show him. And then Adam F Goldberg came on board as an exec producer. And then it was like, Oh, we're cooking with gas now. Wow. Yeah, awesome. man. It was like a snowball effect. It, it like really rolling was. down a hill, like just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And, and then, you know, when we came time to edit it, you know, I, I'm an editor. That's what I consider myself first and foremost. I love to edit, but I also knew I'd never edited something of this magnitude before. Right. Um, and I also knew, you know, it, this was a challenge because we got to move quickly, but not too quickly. It was like, this is really difficult here because we got to give every show its day in the sun, but we also right. got to move pretty quick because, you know, it's got to be like 90 minutes, 120 minutes max. <laughs> well, um, especially nowadays. Cause especially like, nowadays. Everybody, be... everybody, if they want to buy your doc, everyone wants it to be as close to 90 minutes. There was a guy I was a fan of uh, named Bradford Thomason who had directed a documentary called The Rock of Fire Explosion that was all about showbiz pizza. And then he would also, <laughs> yeah, it's great. And then uh, yeah. remember how they had that animatronic band? It's a fantastic doc. And then he had also directed a documentary about Glow, the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. Oh, wow. And, and I was just a big fan of his editing style because he knew how to take things that were kind of nostalgic and pop culture but not make it feel like the toys that made us or something like that, like m- could make it feel a little more artistic, a little more, you know, like a, like a real piece of art. He was good at that. And so uh, he came on board and helped us edit it. And wow. it was awesome. He, he was, he was immense. So I got to work with a lot of mentors of mine and I got to meet a lot of new friends. And like you said, it takes a village and we worked with a lot of amazing people. Our opening credits, if you get to see that, they look awesome. Uh, That was Bradford's wife, Allie Clark. Uh, She did that all herself uh, and it looks awesome. Yeah, I would say like this, this doc has so much heart to it. You could tell like everything is just so like it, it hits the nostalgic heartstrings, but it's, it's past that. Like it's got a thank lot you, of heart, you. you know what I mean? And yeah. the one thing that really stood out to me too, was even that you guys 
if it didn't leave like almost anything out, like you touched on Nick News and yeah. that oh, part that of the story. documentary, it will stay with me, I think, me forever. Too. Yeah. Because that shows me too that just Nickelodeon itself yeah. was not afraid to do yeah. anything. Yeah. And let's talk about this issue and let's like do it like For way real. better than the adults are doing it. Like, yeah, yeah than the adult yeah. world is doing it and that that, that was that part was yeah. really great i'm glad that, you put that in there that little chapter nick news is always the show people joke around about like yep when nick news came on that was time for me to go outside or go do something else and uh i think it's funny because it's not a lot of people's favorite show but i think that part is really the heart of our movie that's the mm -hmm. heart and soul of our movie so i hope it it makes people view nick news in a new light yeah oh you definitely um, did that to me because i did the same thing i'm like nick news there was nick news and then that clip of magic and yeah that little girl the little girl still Crazy. like i'm like what right. like i was i i took a second and i was like oh my god like they did this on tv on and tv yeah this was a thing and like like dan like you're saying like they're doing it they were doing it better than the adults were doing it they didn't talk. They talked about some heavy stuff that kids absolutely need to learn about because, you know, the childhood is like that. It's it's over. And those yeah. people are the adults <laughs> that are. Yeah. I have a nephew that just that's completing basic training in the army this month, you know, and wow. it, it just it seems like just yesterday I was like putting him on my shoulders. Now he could put me on his shoulders yeah. and it happens like that, like that. You know what I mean? And the, all the kids that are watching these shows Nickelodeon knew in just a few years, these are going to be the people that are like calling the shots in our country. And yeah. they wanted them to be as well equipped to handle the world as they could. Oh. And uh, thank God. I mean, they did a great job. I think they did. No, they did a great job. Yeah. I've loved wow. It. I'm. I'll yeah, I, I got it. Uh, this, is, this is such a great, great doc. There's so much that you could have done this. I'm sure like you could probably do a doc for each show that you went over. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they could be a whole doctor on Keenan and Kel because uh, I know Kel too. Like, I mean, his he was so his, his choices for the like the character he created and uh, uh, then went on to be Good Burger and all that stuff was really yeah. amazing. To hear him talk about that. You never think that these things are happening in the backdrop, especially when you're watching in the '90s and your kids and stuff. And but then returning to it with like a new perspective and new eyes really makes you think like. There was so much more happening here. And these kids were like making choices for their Yeah, kids. right. Developing. I mean, the fact that, yeah, when he talks about that, Ed, I mean, Ed is probably one of the most <laughs> iconic characters of 90s Nickelodeon. Amazing. I mean, really, I struggle yeah. to find a character that's more, when I think of like all that or any of that stuff, I mean, that's that's the character. You know, Welcome to Good Burger, home of the Good Burger. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah exactly. So good. And the fact that they let him kind of make that character up. I mean, come yeah. on. That's amazing. Yeah. Like, what other network is going to be like, hey, you're 16. Why don't you create a character? You know, <laughs> yeah. Everyone else is like, hey, you're 16. You're going to do what I tell you to do. You know, that's what right. everybody else was doing and is doing to this very day. You know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you said it earlier in the in the beginning of the podcast. You said it was all about creativity. Yeah. Nickelodeon. You know, like what Disney is all about. It's a formula. It's like, just and, different. And learning. Yeah. And like, you know, or other or our other programs, like, and this was all about like, yeah, we're gonna let you create this. And the kids seemed like kids that you could you would hang out with that could be your oh, friends, yeah. you know. And that's the biggest difference. You know, Disney Channel, I give props to all those kids on the Mickey Mouse Club because they're fantastic entertainers. They're all triple threats. They can sing, dance, act, do it all, and, and look and are perfectly handsome and beautiful you know and that's great that there's something to be said sometimes you just want to be entertained sing yeah. and dance and let me watch you but that can also make some kids feel like crap you know yeah. when you're overweight or underweight or you're way shorter than everybody else way taller than everybody else you have acne and you're looking at these perfect kids it can sometimes make you feel like crap yeah. so that's why i'm just glad there were options you know some kids i'm sure really love mickey mouse club and but Nickelodeon, you know, they if a kid had a zit, they let the kid have a zit. They weren't going to try to put makeup on it to cover mm -hmm. it. Because guess what? Kids have zits. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. I wanted to be at Camp Anawana. Like, oh, that's, oh my God, me too. God. That's oh. right. I wanted to be there. And it's funny, and like when Manny and I do this podcast, what's funny about my childhood is that Nickelodeon and all these shows, I've seen these shows, they, they're part of my memory. They're a big part of my life. While at the same time, my family didn't have cable, which meant that like even the impact of right. was so heavy 
that and so positive and big on my life when I didn't even have cable to watch it, but I had to watch it at my uncle's house, my cousin's house, my friend's houses, like that it was on when I was there or I was putting it on when I got there. So that meant yeah. that like, it was amazing to kind of sit and watch the documentary and be like, I remember all this even without cable in my house at yeah. all. And that was, that really, crazy. I think that really hit That me. is crazy, Dan. I didn't even think about that. Like yeah. that's how, how deep it was. Like, yeah. it's like the water it was like the water cooler talk for kids like you come to school you probably yeah. heard like <laughs> oh you see that nickelodeon and it's like yo you gotta come over like i have it come over like 100 percent. you know Even like snick was absolutely like <sighs> water cooler. So, you know you everybody would watch it on saturday and then on monday you'd be like did you see that kid freaking with the monkey's paw bringing his parents <laughs> back to life that shit was nuts <laughs> You know, absolutely. You yeah, know? yeah. Wow. Oh man, wow. Free, are you free of the dark? Or always remind me of I, I, when you got older. It was like Tales from the Crypt. Yep. Like it was, it was it, like yep. that style. Yeah, you know, yeah. and it was crazy. You know, and to kind of go back to how Mark Summers just acted like a regular adult game show host, and how uh, all that had adult people like Coolio. Uh, <laughs> are you afraid of the dark? It was scary. Those yeah. shows didn't have. Yeah, they didn't hold back. That's they that was literally back. a nightmare machine. Like <laughs> you, you were going home, you were going to bed, and you were being like, "Oh my god, why did I just watch that?" And but yeah. you wanted to watch it. Yeah, if you can, the tale of the dead man's float, you can watch clips of that. There's like a a monster that comes out of the water, and it's just as scary as stuff that was on, you know, Tales from the Crypt or any of the creep show, any of that that stuff. Wow. And a lot of them, like I said, the the kids didn't win in the end. The kids would no. get killed by monsters at the end. And there you go. That's how it <laughs> uh, You know, that's crazy that nobody was like, oh, we can't do that. We got to have that. Make sure you can yeah. have some stuff that's a little spooky. Um, but then you got to have the kids be OK at the end and make sure like, no, this was full on. We want kids to really have something that the same yeah. thing as the adults have. That's just nuts. Yeah, yeah. And they, uh, then they're gonna go watch Red and Stimpy, and then you know, while well, Red is like banging himself in the head with a hammer, trying to. Get that oh my place. gosh! I, I mean, know all that stuff was just like um, unbelievable. I was. Uh, yeah. What well, just a quick, and then this is probably a Google thing, but I'm just gonna ask you because you probably know. So. SpongeBob was a Nickelodeon, right? It yes. Is a Nickelodeon absolutely? That was yeah. after the gold, the the orange years, or like yes. kind of yes. like it so, was kind of like they it comes from that. Yeah, and what I kind of found was that um, SpongeBob was the turning point. Mm. That's whenever it quit being this quaint, small. I mean, it was it wasn't small. It was big, but it was still small enough that they could do crazy stuff. They could still experiment. And SpongeBob, whenever they created SpongeBob, that was their Mickey Mouse. At that point, mm. they were on par with Disney every bit. You know, they were right there. Yeah. And so everybody you know like you said you got investors it wasn't the creator's fault it was you have you have investors and money people that are like make me five spongebobs like we're not going to be doing this other pete and pete are you afraid of the dark this little stuff i need stuff that can be made into toys and plush animals and rides mm -hmm. and video games and movies like that can be a multi-franchise like spongebob they were always trying to create another spongebob after that mm -hmm. but spongebob itself was created from the same pure place that Ren and Stimpy and Doug, they weren't trying to do that when they created SpongeBob. They were just trying no. to make another cool show. If um, you remember the first couple of like seasons, it looked very low budget. Like it was just fun. And then now, I mean, although yeah. I'm, not, I'm not talking down on SpongeBob, but yeah, no, even I think as SpongeBob an adult, I think it's a great, great show. But like, <laughs> yeah, you could see the the power of, I guess, uh, greed is, <laughs> is yeah. what I say. You know, right it's more the effect that it had after that because because spongebob became such a big hit there was no room for these little weird shows anymore you know and yeah it's just the way it's, it is dan and i don't have kids so I, I i do have um nieces and nephews and what are your kids are your kids watching nickelodeon nick jr they is are it? to an extent yeah what what i think is interesting is the way that we watch media is so different like we're experiencing at the same time. Like I actually had to think about which shows that my kids watch mm. are Nickelodeon shows because mm. they watch them on Netflix or Hulu or YouTube. Oh, that's right. Yeah. There are some Nickelodeon shows that they definitely do watch and I think are, are really good. It's just different now, you know, and I have a theory about that okay. because, you know, being in film 
in production, like I always wonder, I was like, why the heck do my kids watch these YouTube videos with no production quality? <laughs> you know, it looks like it's just filmed a web or like a, uh, like a phone or something like that. And it's edited so poorly and it's just got stock music behind it. <laughs> Like, do they liked it. Like, they'd rather watch YouTube than a real show. And I was like, why is that? And then whenever I did this documentary, I, I realized that the reason kids watched Nickelodeon was because they wanted to watch kids that looked like them and reflected them and were real. Mm. Well, all kid shows now are about kids that are secretly a genius. You know, they, mm. or they secretly are a pop star. Or the kids on these shows don't look like real kids. We're kind of back to Mickey Mouse Club. They're all perfect and pretty and yeah. overly talented. And so kids, when they watch the live action shows on Disney and Nick, I don't think they see themselves at all. They see something phony. And so that's why they watch YouTube because it's YouTube is kind of like Nickelodeon. It's by kids for kids on their own terms. Those shows mm -hmm. are just real kids. It, it feels authentic. It's just a kid playing with their toys or unwrapping something or playing video games. But it's just like, hey, you look like me. So I'm connecting with you. Mm. That's huge. Yeah. That's a great observation. Um, yeah, because my nephew does watch someone play Play-Doh. And I yeah. was laughing, like, what? And I'm like, yeah, he, and then he wants to go buy Play-Doh, but like he's watching this woman. Well, she's probably like 18, 19. She unpacks it and like she, he's watching. Yeah. And now that you're saying it, like it's exactly like a low budget show. It's like that, a low budget what Nickelodeon was. show. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And in the beginning of the documentary, you mentioned even Nickelodeon started, they, they used to have crazy kids jumping out of planes and doing this. And like kids were like, I'm not into this. Like, it made I'm them not feel that horrible. great. Yeah, it made, <laughs> like they, it made them feel they felt it, terrible. <laughs> it made them feel terrible. Instead of it, it does inspire you, kind of, but it also is like, ah. Yeah. I, yeah, like my parents can't afford a plane. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. It's like I can like have an imaginary friend, or I can maybe go to camp, or I can yeah. just be a kid at school, and that's what I can do. Um, so like, yeah, like that's why maybe a show, a show like Pete and Pete or Clarissa, like they hit that those spots because it's like, oh, I can literally walk through the hallways in my school or walk out my door and there's the there's that person right or someone that's yeah. like that and i and also like the creators like they're creating from those spaces when like i mean not to jump all the way back to doug i mean but when i saw the creator of doug and i was like that's doug yeah like, <laughs> he is doug. like no wonder it just came from those life experiences and the fact that like the way he explained it how like doug isn't popular but doug isn't also not popular he's right there in the middle yeah. he's the dude that just is there and I was like, wow, that's a whole other thing to think about because it I, was just an average kid. Yeah. Which yeah. most people are. Most exactly. people are. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like, like that. Yeah. And we're coming from the eighties where it's like everybody in an eighties movie is either like the nerd or the jock or the stone or like breakfast club, you know, which I think is yeah. a great movie, but it's like, it's all the archetypes. And even that movie plays with them. Like it's not what you think. So I guess breakfast club is a bad example, but a lot of other like movies that imitated the breakfast club had like all that. And that's just not how most kids are. They're like, like you said, they're like, Doug, they're just, I'm kind of in the middle. Like I'm, I'm kind of, I, I have friends, but I'm not popular, but I'm also not the total yeah. door, you know? Yeah. And yeah. even the girl that he liked, I mean, her voice, I mean, the fact how they found that voice and I mean, yeah, but that even plays on that. Like, it doesn't do that stereotypical thing of like, well, if this is the girl he likes, we're going to give her this really like easy voice to listen to. to hear. Yeah. It's like the nanny. Like she's like right in your face with her. It's voice. a little abrasive. Yeah. But that's. Yeah. I love the commercial clip that you got though. Cause Holy I remembered God. that commercial. Oh really? Did you? Yeah. I was that's like, awesome. Oh my God. I remember this commercial. There, and uh, there's I thought a, it was great. A little fun trivia. You know, like I said, I, I was getting clips wherever I could on YouTube. And I found a YouTube channel called uh, Consumer Time Capsule. And that's where I found that clip. I was just searching for it. I was like, I got to find the clip that he's talking about. And I was searching and I, and I found it and I wrote the dude. I was like, can I use this clip? And he's like, yeah, what for? You know, and I told him and much like all of us, he's like, no crap. You're making a Nickelodeon doc. This sounds amazing. So we got to talking and he's like, yeah, we, we were somehow we got talking on the phone about it. And then he was like, yeah. He's like, hey, can I tell you something? And I'm like, yeah, what's up? And he's like, I've got a piece of the aggro crag. No. <laughs> yeah. Holy nostalgia. Like we, I didn't even know. Out of nowhere? All, all, well, as soon as I told him, 
like I'm doing a Nickelodeon doc. He's like, oh, hey, can I call you? And we can just talk about it. Yes. Uh, yeah, because originally all I, w- I was just reaching out to him because I wanted to use this mayonnaise commercial that had Patty Mayonnaise, uh, the voice of it on there. And he's like, oh, that's cool. You're making a Nickelodeon doc. He's like, I got to tell you something. I got a piece of the aggro crack. <laughs> wow. And I was like, what, what are the odds, you know? And so yeah. in, in the, at the end of the movie, when the credits are rolling, we show a bunch of people, um, like fans, and there's a dude with an aggro crack, yeah. and that's him. That's oh, him? Yeah. Because wow. I was going to say, like, I love that part of two at the end yeah. was you showing, like, this one, like, it's like a gallery that has all the, looks like it has the nose from Double Dare, yeah. and it has the lockers and stuff. Yeah. And then that, that was, guy. And I yeah. was like, oh, this is so cool. And then, like, you know, how that everybody is, like, realizing that there are people like there us are people like us yeah show and know? it kind of mirrors like what adam and i went through we we're like we we're like is anybody else gonna be like this and yeah the answer is yes uh and it started because when we started the documentary we didn't know who we were gonna get you know and we kind of wrote the plot of what we thought it would be but you don't really know until you're editing you know you don't really know what it's you kind of write i always say you write a documentary twice you know yeah. you write it original you should you should kind of have an idea. So you're not just going into it blind asking people, you know, cause you're wasting people's time asking them questions that you know, aren't going to be in the documentary at all. So we interviewed some fans and then we're like, God, there's really no room for them, you know, because we got so many people from Nickelodeon and we were already struggling to get it to 90 minutes. We're like, there's no, where do we put them? And then we're like, Oh, the in credits you know yeah. <laughs> we get we'll give those people and there's a uh, a company called mondo that you might have heard of that they're based out of austin and they do a lot of like re-releases like posters and stuff and they have a gallery and that was actually one of the very first things we ever filmed before we would film any interviews we uh because it's it was mondo is based out of austin texas mm-hmm. so it was just we could just hop over there so oh, we wow. just we just went there they were doing a nickelodeon gallery right when adam and i decided we were going to do this Wow. So it was literally the first thing we did where we just filmed a bunch of people. Uh, and then it was great that we found a place to put it in the documentary. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That was cool. That was really cool. I thought you guys like set that up. <laughs> That's awesome. That like, I know, it just, yeah. just so serendipitous, like, wow. Happened. It know? just happened. They were doing a, a, yeah, a gallery right when we were doing a documentary. That's amazing. So we did it. And those Mondo Mondo, if, if anyone isn't familiar, check out their posters and stuff. They've got really neat, like, kind of artistic re-releases of like movie posters and all sorts of stuff yeah oh that's cool did everything that you wanted to get in there got got in there or do you feel like were there things that you wish you got in the doc that you weren't able to get or things that you had to cut out that you're just like oh i wish oh yeah i to put that in there i mean it's funny like adam and i pitched this so hard as a docuseries we tried to get people to buy it as a docuseries oh, wow. and nobody would and then once it's out everyone's like this should be a docuseries and we're like yeah, we tried and nobody was <laughs> like, we couldn't get anyone to buy it. And and I wish somehow, I don't know what the legality of this is, but if, if either we could maybe do a Blu-ray that's extended or do like a, a Snyder cut later on, that's like four <laughs> hours long. That movie, by the way? Uh, <laughs> I tried. Hour. I watched a little bit of it. I was like, why is this in 4.3? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny that you said that. I thought something went wrong with my computer and I'm yeah. like, what? what and then i'm like four three we're not watching this on imax right now like everyone knows it's being like we're in the middle of what we're in and like it's being released on uh, on hbo max like what are you doing like yeah yeah but i will say like a better storyline big time and and i think that it's awesome that that happened i hope that that happens more now that uh because you always hear stories about how people are like oh yeah the movie that came out was nothing like what I made at all. You know, like you hear about that guy, Josh Trank, who did that Fantastic Four movie. He's like, oh yeah, that's not even close to the movie that that I wanted yeah. to make at all. They totally ripped Just it trying. apart and made it, you know? So I'd love to see more of that happen where it's like, let's do both. Because I get it. Like they could never have put it out as four hours to begin with, but oh, you right. can do the director's cut, you know, more a mainstream release of the director's cut. But, you know, Adam and I are looking into like, could we do a, uh, like a four part series or something like that. Cause we have so much footage. We have so really? much footage. It's insane. Uh, so were there and, shows that didn't make it in? They're not really. Um, everybody that we talked to, we used pretty much. There was, a, we were, we started working on a wild and crazy kids segment 
And that didn't make it in because we didn't get, we couldn't get the footage from Wild and Crazy Kids. It's, mm. it's, there's not high quality. That's never been re-released. And the only footage we could find, and we didn't have enough behind the scenes footage. We tried to always get footage that both, we could have at least two people. We wanted to have at least two people on a show. Right. And then uh, we wanted to have like footage that people hadn't seen. And, and there, we just, it, it was just this whole thing. And it kind of, we couldn't find out where we wanted to put it. So that part kind of got cut. Um, and then the Nick at night part got cut. Mm -hmm. um, so there were no like, I mean, all the interviews pretty much that we did, there was maybe three interviews that we did that didn't unfortunately make it in there. But all, I mean, everybody's interview was for like an hour, an hour and a half. So, I mean, you know, we could have done like Doug, Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, like and Rocco, like the original Nick Tunes, a full like 45 minute episode just on that. You know, yeah, like, yeah. like maybe put two or three shows for each one. And, and do like a game show episode or something like that because we had so much footage. Nobody, it's funny, nobody wants to buy a, a docu. They're nervous to buy it, but then they're saying they want it at the same time. It's just weird. That's like, weird. Because it's yeah. funny that they're, they're nervous right now because, I mean, I'm not in the business, so, but everyone's just watching things and no one has anything to watch anymore. I know. Because we've binged watched for a year. <laughs> so like, yeah. you can't watch The Wire anymore. Although I like, haven't watched The Wire and I need to, uh, I was told. But like, why wouldn't you? Because I know you need it's content. like people. It was only after the movie came out and it like got some traction and people liked it that they're like, "Oh, you should have made this into a docu series." Like, yeah, remember we were trying to sell you guys on yeah. that. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't think there's Nickelodeon warrants a docu series. You know? Wow. It's like, well, if collecting exotic tigers can warrant a docu series. <laughs> I yeah. think that Nickelodeon could. Right? Sure. Like, oh, come on. That, that's like, uh, oh, that been... that's short sighted because, like, it, there was so much going on. I mean, I mean, we could go on and on. I mean, we didn't even talk about the cube thing. I mean, but what I mean is, like, there's mm -hmm. so much in the foundation of yeah. what happens even before you even get to so much of this amazing stuff that you guys put together. Yeah. That a docuseries would have been, why not? It's one of the most influential networks probably of all time uh, yeah. at this point so i think that you know that was kind of short-sighted on people but i but i think like what you guys were able to accomplish in this documentary was just astounding to me that i and it just i think hopefully that like what happens is that do people do want more and that you yeah. have footage you have and then you or you could would get more funding to kind of keep digging because there's so much there that like it, yeah people would i think really it's, like love it's already it. there we, we all we would have to do is re-edit it it's like we wouldn't even really have to i mean we could shoot a couple more interviews but yeah it's like with very little effort we could expand this this uh, podcast is uh, brought to you by nostalgia brewing company owned and operated by manny quillo one of the co-hosts of the nostalgia test podcast find nostalgia brewing at uh nostalgiabrewing.com it's based out of long island farmingdale main street 12 beers on tap new york wine and spirits as well so you keep saying you sold it with how many places did you sell it to? So we sold, uh, we kind of found this out. Um, the way it works is really like the idea of selling right to Netflix or right to Hulu or right to HBO, something that happens like so rarely it does happen. Like, I don't know if you guys saw class action park. Yes. Uh, I need I to love that. That what documentary do is. What did you think? I Dude, liked it. Have you been to that Class Action Park? No, I never had. I never I had oh, Action Park. I have. Well, we live right. Dan and I grew up near there. Okay, like, so it's York, not so that far away from where there. we grew up. We grew up on Long Island, and it that was where you went, right? Yeah, I went there three times. No joke. Yeah, man. I went there and, once. And once was a. You know how they say it was like a badge of honor, like you survived Action Park. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time I went, that loop thing was always closed. Has God, closed. thank God. And there was always the theory, like. Someone died on that thing. Someone got stuck. And they're like, yeah. no way. It was exact. Like everything about that documentary was so great. Cause I was just, I, I was like, I wish they interviewed me because like, oh my God, <laughs> it was exactly what that thing was. I'm like, oh, this, this was real. And it was so crazy to know that 15 year olds were running a park. Like it's crazy <laughs> to think about that now is insane. <laughs> I remember going off the slide and I was supposed to be 99 pounds. Like, I'm not telling them that I'm 95 pounds, <laughs> right? They're like, go. I didn't touch oh, the my slide God. till the bottom. That means I was just falling. Oh, sh Like I was just falling. And like, I then eventually hit the slide. Like I was like, oh, I could have died on that thing. 
so yeah like, easily yeah 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 they had like cliff diving no one was what like there was a person watching you but there's like go and people were just was... running and jumping off like no one cared and people could make it. i i love i thought that doc was really cool um but you know they show they sold right to hbo so it happens but it's like so rare but uh, the majority of the time like you sell to a distributor this is just what i've learned is like and then they sell it to they get it everywhere else and okay. we are working with an awesome distributor called Gravitas Ventures. Uh, after a couple, of, we had a couple of mishaps. People always are like, the film debuted in 2018 and didn't come out until late 2020. What happened? It was a whole nightmare where this 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 company um, that we really thought was going to be the company that made us, we came and was going to buy it and then tried to not put it out and shelve it. It was just a whole yeah. nightmare. We were able to get it back. And then uh, Gravitas came in and was like, we want it. Uh, and they, they're the same people that own the Ren and Stimpy dock. And they also have uh, Wolfman's got Nards. Have you seen that? It's the it's the Monster Squad dock. What? Oh, God. Yeah, dude. Oh, it's really? amazing. Check it you out. Know, that's our that's our like one of our tests coming up next year in the, during the Halloween. I was like, uh, maybe you could Monster maybe Squad. you could get him on there. Uh, his name is Andre. I, I don't know him or anything, but, but yeah. the, kid, the main kid, uh, I think his name was Sean in Monster Squad. He's the director of the film. Stop. He directed oh the Monster God. Squad doc. Wolfman's yeah. Man's got nards. Wolf, Wolf and the, that's what the nards. documentary is called. Wolfman's got nards. Uh, so they had a lot of documentaries, and and I had friends that had sold to Gravitas, and they're great. They're awesome. Um, and so they put it out, and they've now. I mean, right now, it, anywhere you can rent or buy movies digitally, like transactional video on demand, is what I've learned the technical term for it. It's there. iTunes, oh, Amazon, Google Play, uh, Red. Redbox Digital, that's a thing. Uh, <laughs> Fandango, Voodoo, like any of those places where you can like, you know, pay. And it's not that much money to like buy it or rent it. Uh, you can you can do it. It's it's everywhere. Oh, everyone's got to watch it. I mean, it's really amazing. I so mean, you I sold to care. them. And then... Yeah, Gra- Gravitas bought it and now they're selling it to, to all um... the other places. Yeah, so they're getting you, it. Like, I'm getting deep on this. Did you, did you make extra from a certain sales or just yeah that's... yeah so the way that it works is uh every time they sell it uh i mean they get a percentage and we get a percentage basically okay so it's like yeah it's like beer distributing like we okay sell them and, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly they're they they're us. kind of like a like a distributor <laughs> they're like a sales company yeah so they're they, they're the ones that got it on it and thank god they did because yeah it's not it's something that like you think like i'll just do it myself it's like nah they got us written up in Rolling Stone and the Nerdist and all stuff that we could have never done ourselves, you know? And, yeah, they got and, a whole crew. Just getting it, they got a whole crew. <laughs> let, like, let the professionals do what they do so that I can just focus on the more artistic stuff. But yeah. they got us everywhere. Like, I mean, it's everywhere. It's everywhere, like, that you can rent movies uh, online. Um, they've done a great job. And, um, yeah, it's been out for a little while now. And hopefully, you know, who knows where it'll go next they're continuing to get it more and more places. You, Blu-ray and DVD is also available on Amazon too, for people that still like a physical copy. Oh, oh wow. Nice. Great. They designed all of it and it's, it looks good. And it's, uh, wow. they got it out there. That's, I mean, the, the most important thing they're well, I definitely, I love it and wish you luck on yeah. it. And, uh, I can't wait to blow this thing up and keep telling people that they need yeah. to rent and buy it. Everyone has to rent, oh, buy, watch it, watch it with your friends. This is like one of those things that people need to just, it, it's something that you could keep watching and find something new, like when you see it, because there's so much in it. There's so much going on. And it also made me want to go back and watch these shows again and then rewatch other things. So I feel like there's this like <laughs> an amazing relationship between like your documentary and these shows and co- go and returning to them and stuff like that. And um, it really was an amazing experience. And I feel, yeah, it was such a privilege to kind of see it and even sit here and talk to you. I, I feel like there was just, so, we could go on for hours. I, I have like, so we could. Things, yeah. So. You know what you're doing is also, you're going to get old friends to start talking to each other when we're all allowed to like actually hang out with each other. I know. Um, right. And someone brings up like, Oh, did you see the Nickelodeon car- uh, documentary? And then instead of Googling, you could actually be like, yeah, Doug was on like, I feel like you guys are going to cause like more social interactions. Um, I hope so. This comes out. Yeah. So yeah. I hope so. I mean, it's just, it's a, po- it's a very positive documentary and yeah. the world is such a dark, crazy, cynical place now. <sighs> yeah. And you know, if you just want to kind of get a, fun nostalgic blast I, I i hope that we we can give that to some people you know yeah. and then shoot and it gives you something to shoot for too you know maybe 
the world can can be uh, like that again, but even better, you know, an even, mm -hmm. an even better place than it was. Wow. Well, before we go, though, hold on. I'm putting yeah. this, I, I'm going to ask you, movie, <laughs> our first movie, our, I don't know if you heard our first episode, but I have an obsession with Cocktail. Did you ever see that movie? With yeah, Tom? with Tom Cruise. Yeah. Okay. What? <laughs> what's your feeling about Cocktail? God, it's been so long. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like whenever you could make a movie like the like the over the top. The eighties were like, <laughs> you know, like let's make a movie about uh, arm wrestling. Oh, oh, cool! Let's make a movie about a guy who's like a, a bartender and makes cocktails. Like, okay, I mean, yeah, really? yeah. It was like the original mixology movie. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. We, we dissect it. I love it for because of how cheesy and bad it is. It's it's yes. bad. I know that. And and like if you listen to the episode, I like Dan hates it. And well, I just, like I have yeah. this like fascination with Tom Cruise that Tom, you know, Tom Cruise is just Tom Cruise in every movie. Yeah, totally. Like in in eighties and nineties, like they're entertaining. Like you know, and that movie has such a bad rating on uh, Rotten Tomatoes <laughs> that I want it to be better. <laughs> and as like because there's been other movies that we reviewed. I'm like, how is this better? How is this rated better than Cocktail? And I was like, the movie's about nothing. Right. But it's so cheesy i think yeah. it's so good like there's so many one-liners that coglin yeah. the his his basically obi-wan of bartending oh my god is him is that's like, right it's so yeah good. like that has a seven percent rotten tomatoes rating and, and we talked about killer clowns from outer space and that has a bigger a better rating than and we were like how did that happen but yeah. like it was just one of those movies like that started this whole podcast and like um we, yeah, uh, to me, I felt it was just a nostalgic movie. I, I can't let it pass that <laughs> line into being good. You know, I know, I know it so well, Scott, that I, if I start watching and you shut off the the volume, I can. You can say every word. Me. Yeah, yeah. It was you my know, mom's favorite movie, so like okay. I used to watch it with my mom all so the time. So weird. Which is such a weird movie to watch with your mom. Think about it. Too. <laughs> there, there was a show that was on Nickelodeon. Like so many of their shows hold up. So many Nickelodeon shows hold up, mm -hmm. but there's one that absolutely does not. And you should, everybody should go watch this. It was called 15 and it was a soap opera for little kids. Exactly. No one ever remembers it. Because <laughs> it didn't last 15? very long. And everybody that, yeah, everybody that watched it forgot about it because it was so bad, but uh, it was a soap opera for little kids. So right there, it's flawed from the beginning because oh little kids don't want to watch a soap opera and it's like dramatic over the top acting but here's the thing. It was the first ever acting job or like real acting job of Ryan Reynolds. Dead. Oh, no. wow. And he's like 13. He's like, I just want to be in a band. And he's like, he's like, oh, they kicked me out of my band. Like he's so upset <laughs> about getting kicked out of a band. Oh, it's, my all, it's all Canadian. It's all Canadian. The Canadian accents are so thick. Oh, um, yes. I did a, I did a podcast called that aged well we're kind of similar they kind of like this yeah yeah but and but they really take apart like sh stuff that was horrible and really take the piss out of it you know and they're like you want to be on there but we're going to be making fun of something so what nickelodeon do you want to make fun of and i was like can it be 15 because one that show deserves to get made fun of and also like i didn't really want to make fun of one of the shows that like i interviewed somebody for yeah, yeah. <laughs> like hey thanks for the free interview I'm going to make fun of your show now. Yeah. Uh, and so they agreed to do it. And so we just roasted 15. It's like, check it out. It's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous show. It's like, nobody acts like this. It's like, who wrote, it's like troll two level of bad. Oh like, my God. Dialogue is just like, what? Like nobody speaks like this. Yeah. Wow. Well, Scott, thank you so much. This was so much fun. We are so happy that you were able to come on that you reached out and I, this was this was amazing for, for us i i think that i don't know manny i mean yeah I, there's nothing i i'm more yeah. than i could, i keep repeating it but this is this is yeah. a really great film i'm really pumped for you guys uh i can't wait to see what else you guys are coming yeah up the line. and i hope the production company gets even more shots of doing stuff and i can't i'm i was really excited yeah. um and like you've given me and dan plenty of lists to uh to, to go back to these shows and just gonna watch them and try to uh, put them to the test, but I already know that pretty much everything that's in that in that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely going back to watch Pete. You know. and Pete. I have to now. Yeah, like, I have to. Um, so, but you should. Pete and Pete yeah. is fantastic. 
but and everyone... it was probably it was somewhere close to where you guys were i think it was like based out of like new jersey or something mm-hmm. i think is where it was all shot yeah it was serious yeah. man that, yeah. that part that part uh and this is a nostalgia test tangent and that's a nostalgia test tangent but that part when uh he's letting go of his oh my god his ma- imaginary friend or what and like <laughs> yeah like growing up and i was like oh man just imagine like that yeah being that age yeah. you know yeah was- that hit me i can remember that hitting me in the feels back then when i watched it even and then definitely now where you're like mm. i can remember that like that time period where you're a kid but you're not a little kid anymore and you kind of have to let go of these things. You just, you just know it's time, but yeah. you're not really, I can remember like, you know, like playing with toys, you oh, know, it's just like, gonna say that. It, I went from being proud of my toys when my friends would come over. I'm like, look at all my action figures to now. Like when my friends would come over, I'd be like hiding them, you know? Cause I'm like, Oh, if they find out I play with toys, they're going to like make fun of me. Yeah. Uh, you know? And it's like, this is time to stop doing this stuff, you know? And it's just such a, such a bittersweet time. Cause you know, something new is coming up, like dating and all that fun yeah. stuff is right. It's but it is sad that you have to let go. Like just when you're comfortable with who you are mm. as like a, a, a kid, you got to let that person go and mm. go into a totally new world. Yeah. Yeah. That's wow. crazy. Because it's funny thing is that you went through that. That means your friends who you're hiding it from was. Going yeah, to the same thing. totally. Like, I they were probably I was telling my wife that I remember the day that the last time I played with toys in the tub wow and i was like wow she's like you remember that day i'm like yeah because it was like i told myself like it's it's time to be done with this it's time to stop yeah yeah and i was like i can't believe as a kid i thought that like i actually yeah said, like, you know like yeah. think about like kids like oh they're immature but like that's like a kind of a very mature like thing to think about like no this will be the last time i do this like mm-hmm. yeah to let it go and that's bittersweet man that's yeah tough yeah wow and now we're uh all living nostalgically and uh one of the- <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah. Oh, we have friends that have like they love to show their toys that they have and stuff so i know it all comes yeah. full circle yeah wow well everybody find you know go out watch the the orange years the nickelodeon story it's amazing it's gonna hit you in all the right spaces and really it's gonna make you just like really love and appreciate not just your childhood again but like all the amazing hard work that went into making your childhood probably one of the greatest childhoods of all time. I mean, seriously, that's what I felt like after watching this. And Scott, thank you once again for coming on. Oh, I am, um, we're totally appreciative and uh, for your time and uh, everyone, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Shoot, you know, shoot us a message. Let us know uh, what you think on uh, the website and when the episode goes up and um yeah, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Dan, Manny, Thanks, the pleasure was all mine. I had a blast. And if you ever need anything Nickelodeon related, please give me a shout. Oh, of course. Definitely. Absolutely. Oh, we're putting you to test in some episodes. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to call you out. And you're going to do a whole, whole nostalgia test podcast test and how crazy it gets and the tangents will get crazy. Oh, boy. So. Well, everyone, that's thanks so much. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Please subscribe to the Nostalgia Test podcast to know when new episodes drop. Don't forget to leave us five stars and a positive review so more people can find the podcast. Share your thoughts and memories on today's topic on our Twitter, at Nostalgia Test, and on Instagram, at The Nostalgia Test. Tune in next time, because you never know what pop culture will pop up on The Nostalgia Test. <laughs>